Ottawa, Ontario. Capital city, compassionate city. A city where stories are told, stories are cherished, and stories, for your enjoyment, are shared at the 27th Annual Children's Storytelling Festival online at the Ottawa Public Library. As a teacher, I use stories in the classroom. Oral storytelling is the foundation for literacy skills. As a mother, I used stories as a tool to get the two-year-old into that car seat and played story games. Round and round the garden goes the teddy bear. Tickly! And tell me, what happens next? Distracted? The buckle's done up. As an artist, it's the magic that happens as the child's eyes light up. The teller's words create the story, but it's truly the child's imagination in that space between teller and listener, in the air the story takes place. Magic. Sambonani, hello friends. How are you doing today? Today, I'm gonna share a story all the way from the motherlands, from South Africa. Today, I'm gonna share the story of Bubezi the lion and, oh, that trickster, Jackal. Hey, are you guys ready for a story? Yeah! Then say the words with me. Once upon a time. Everybody, let's go. Once upon a time. You're so beautiful, one more time. Once upon a time. Mm, 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 mm. Many, many moons ago, I say, many, many moons ago. So long ago, in the southern regions of Africa, Jackal was busy walking. Mm, mm, mm. Looking and looking for something good to eat. For it had been a long time since he had something good to eat. And his tummy was rumbling. So Jackal was walking and walking between the long tall grass. When there in the far distance, he saw Bubezi the lion, <laughs> the king of all the creatures. Now, my friends, we all know that Jekyll, <laughs> Jekyll is the trickster. How many times has he played tricks on poor Bubezi the lion? <laughs> Too many. My friends, Jackal was so hungry, he couldn't think of any trick to play on Bubezi. For as Bubezi was coming closer, Jackal thought, eh, Bubezi the lion, he looks hungry, he might eat me. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? So storytelling for me um, comes from my background, my family. I'm from South Africa and when my father, my father's my greatest inspiration when it comes to telling stories because at night when he would tell us a story, he wouldn't just, you know, read it, he would embody the story and involve us in the story and he would act out the whole thing and it would be Jackie and the beanstalk and he would become the giant and scare us so much. And it wasn't just that, it was stories that we would share around the kitchen table by my grandmother's house where my grandfather would share his pearls of wisdom and we would sit and listen and my aunties and uncles and cousins, we'd sit around the kitchen table just listening and sharing our own stories about the day or about the week or things that happened to us or about aunties and uncles living overseas and uh, it was really inspirational. Well, there's, you know, there's that saying, jack of all trades, but they don't finish the quote. Um, so I'm just going to share that quote with you quickly, because I think it's so important, especially with the times we're living in right now. 
So the full phrase is a jack of all trades is a master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. So people leave out that last one, but oftentimes better than a master of one. And I think that's always stuck to me. My father would always encourage me to um, you know, be anything I want to be. And so when I would tell people, but I'm an artist, but I also do this and this and that. And, and then I was like, but wait, I can do it all. But one thing at a time. I love theater. And I started off with children's theater and then started doing musical theater and uh, just straight theater after a while. But then I wanted to write. So what did I want to write? I wanted to write short stories for children. And the next thing you know, I get invited to be on stage by uh, the Luce family who were organizing uh, an Ottawa f arts festival as a storyteller. So I was performing my own original material uh, back in the 80s. And the next thing from there, it's... Uh, learning how to tell stories to not only children but to adults and I just had fun. It's been going on ever since. When it works it is such a beautiful way of sharing with other people. To see them laugh, to see them feel the emotions that I'm trying to get across or the story is trying to get across. That is a beautiful feeling. Part of it is showmanship that comes from theater and part of it is engaging an audience. Her mother kept telling her, whatever you do, don't walk through the cemetery because that's where Simon Tutu lives. Well, one morning she woke up and the clock had not rung. Her mother had not called up, it's time for breakfast and school. No. She ran down the stairs, she grabbed what she needed, she ran out of the house. She knew she was going to be late. And that's when she had the idea. She would climb over the stone wall of the cemetery, run through the cemetery, climb over the other stone wall, and she would get to school. And she did. She got to school just as the bell rang. Well, after school, she had her backpack, she had her math homework, she was ready to go home, and she thought to herself, why would I go all the way around the cemetery when I had no trouble going through it this morning? My mother doesn't know what she's talking about, and so she climbed that stone wall and began her walk through the very center of that cemetery. And that's when she saw this tree. It had been blasted by lightning, charred, not a single leaf on it, but there was color. Why, there was a bird on one of the branches, and that bird had feathers every color under the sun. And those feathers went from the bird and the branch down, 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 all the way to the ground. And while she was looking at where the feathers touched, she saw a stone, just the right size to throw. She picked it up and she hurled that stone right at the bird, hit the bird, and the bird fell and landed with a dull thud. She went over to the bird, and with her foot, she nudged the bird. It was dead. She continued walking. She had only gone a few paces when a voice began to sing. Why for you shoot to me now? Why for you shoot to me now? Me a Simon Tutu, why for you shoot to me now? Her feet stuck to the ground like Velcro. She tried pulling one foot, pulling the other. It would not move. Neither leg would move. She was stuck. 
for me, it started um, primarily with the, the girl guides. I was a guide leader and I was sent on a, a nature workshop in, uh, in the States. And the workshop leader, a fellow named Joseph Cornell, started by telling uh, a story of John Muir on the Stikeen Glacier. And I thought it was a fabulous story. And uh, well, lo and behold, the book was for sale in the camp gift shop for $9.95. I was a stay-at-home mom with exactly ten dollars in my pocket to buy supper on the way home, so belly won over book. I put the kids to bed, sat down in the hall between their rooms and told them what I remembered of the story. And that's when I realized I could storytell. Previously, I'd been going into their classes reading to them, but always some child at the back of the room is saying, Miss, Miss, I can't see the pictures. So now the kids could make their own pictures. It helps me interact with people, particularly children. I, when you tell to children, they tell with you. They pull the story out. They, they animate it. Uh, it's just such good fun. Aaron was chasing butterflies in the backyard when Mummy said, time to go to the babysitter. The babysitter saw Aaron's sad face and said, Aaron, you need to cheer up. We're going to make a gingerbread kit. So they took a big bowl and they stirred up lots of good things. And then they rolled out the cookie dough and cut out a gingerbread kit. A head, two arms, two legs. And Aaron decorated the cookie. Raisins for eyes, half a walnut for a nose, a cinnamon heart for a smile, and three chocolate buttons. The babysitter put that gingerbread kid in the oven and she said, don't open the door until the bell rings. What did that babysitter say? Don't open the door until the bell rings. Aaron sat down on a stool and looked through the little glass window in the oven door and the babysitter went to weed the garden. The gingerbread kid got brown and puffy and crispy round the edges and all of a sudden, that gingerbread kid started to shout, Help! Help! I'm burning up! It's hot in here! Let me out! Now, Aaron remembered that the babysitter said, Don't open the oven until the bell rings. But what if the cookie really burned? Aaron opened the oven just a tiny little bit for a cool breeze. But that gingerbread kid jumped up and out of the oven and ran round the kitchen table shouting, you can run, you can run till you flip your lid, but you can't catch me, I'm the gingerbread kid. And out the back door went the gingerbread kid and right behind them went Aaron with the butterfly net. The babysitter saw the gingerbread kid and she shouted, stop, stop. Little gingerbread kid, you look good enough to eat. Gingerbread kid laughed and shouted, You can run, you can run till you flip your lid, but you can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread kid. And the gingerbread kid ran down the street. Right behind came the babysitter with a handful of weeds and Aaron with a butterfly net. At the corner of the street, the crossing guard held up a stop sign. Stop, stop, little gingerbread kid. You look good enough to eat. Gingerbread kid laughed and shouted, You can run, you can run till you flip your lid, but you can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread kid. And the gingerbread kid dashed across a busy road. Right behind came the crossing guard with a stop sign, babysitter with a handful of weeds, and Aaron with the butterfly net. Joy. 
come to storytelling from stand-up comedy and theater. So for me as well, storytelling is a way to connect to people. And I often use comedy and laughter as a way to bond with my audience, as a way to connect through common experiences. And then I use those common experiences to then go into the particulars of my own life. The next day at recess, when that bell rang, I charged my chair down those school halls and out the school door, and there was Toby waiting for me. He jumped right on the back of my chair again and goes, take me to the moon. I charged forward, trying to shake Toby off. And all that week at recess, we played that same game where he would try jumping onto the back of my chair and I would try driving away before he could even get on. I was having fun with Toby. But the next week, after school, playing with Peter John and Ian in front of my house, Peter suddenly asked, Alan, why are you hanging around with Toby all the time? He's a goof, haven't you noticed? And I had noticed that Toby would say and do things that no one else would ever dream of. But I said to Peter, well, Toby's the only one who's even talking to me at school. I feel like everyone's avoiding me. No one's avoiding you. Peter said, they just don't know who you are yet. They need to, a way to get to know who you are. So we came up with a plan. We, we came up with a plan. The next day at recess, Peter brought a big long rope onto his career and he put out a challenge that me and him and John and Ian would take on 10 of the strongest people in the game of, of tug of war. Now, my wheelchair weighs oh, about 500 pounds, but no one had to go near that on that day. And it did take a moment, but soon there were 10 people lining up, willing to take us on. Peter stood at the head of our team and he passed the rope back to John, who passed the rope back to Ian, who made a little loop on the end of the rope so that when Ian pa passed the rope back to me, I secretly hooked it onto my wheelchair. 
someone in the crowd yelled, Go! And the other team started pulling and pulling and pulling and leaning way back on the rope. But that rope would not budge. No, it wouldn't move until I started slowly driving my wheelchair backwards. And then there was nothing the other team could do but be slowly pulled forwards. But they wouldn't give up. I had to drag them all across the schoolyard to the other side and back before they finally said, okay, okay, you win. And after that, everyone wanted to be on my tug of war team. And soon I got to meet more people at school. I'd like to say that maybe it doesn't mean so much more than in your culture, because your culture had a written language. So if you have stories, they were recorded, they were written down. And in the indigenous community, we had oral tradition. Oral tradition is not just about story. It's about passing down history. It's about passing down knowledge, land use knowledge, how to work with each other. And of course, to maintain strength for survival. And many of these stories hold that knowledge. So it holds ways of being. So, you know, sometimes there's stories about animals. Sometimes there's stories about different things that happen to people. It's unbelievable things that might have happened to people. But that's still happening today. And Jonas told me that when he first went to residential school, he was five years old and they went in the back of a truck. All the kids were put into the back of the truck and he said there was kind of wooden, a wooden frame built around it and a tarp was thrown over these children as if they were potatoes or something, I suppose. He said, by the time we got there, we were so dusty and thirsty. He said, it was pathetic. And when he got to school, he had very long hair and uh, his mother used to tie it back and braid it and tie it in the back. And he said, that's the first thing they removed from me, is my hair. And they doused me, he said, with coal oil, because he said that I had lice. He said, I never had lice in my life. And he said, uh, it was about a month, a month being there, and one of the boys got chicken pox. He said, you know, I never saw an infected wound in my six years, five or six years on, on earth. He said, I, I, I never saw that. Because he said, we lived in the bush, uh, made darn sure we didn't get injured or have any kind of open wound. So what they did there at Chutla, they call this residential school Chutla. He said, all of a sudden, all the boys were called into this huge area. He said, this is where they showered us. He said, the other thing you must know, if you live in the bush, you never get naked. Of course, you keep your body clean, but you never get totally naked. He said, either it's too cold or it's so many mosquitoes that you'd be foolish if you got yourself naked. He says, not to say we didn't go swimming, but you're just in and out. And he said, he got, this person gathered all of the boys together in this big shower area. And 
we got there, they told us to take off all our clothes. He said, I didn't like that. And he said, there was a boy standing in the middle of this room, covered with scabs. He said, that was first the first shock to me. And he was standing there and he was naked. And they told us to take our clothes off and to go and touch this boy. He said, there was no way. He said, I, first of all, he said, I put up a fight. I didn't want to take my clothes off. Why? So he said, they forced me to. And then I had to go touch this boy. He said, I felt so ashamed to touch him, to embarrass him, to make him feel so bad because he had this condition on his skin. And I didn't want to touch him. Anyways, one of those supervisors took my hand and put it on his body. Needless to say, he said, <laughs> there was a whole bunch of chicken pox kids in that school shortly thereafter. He said, I didn't know what chicken pox was. I had no idea. Stories are about indigenous pedagogy. In one story, so many things are captured for the well-being of your emotions. So there's emotional intelligence within the story. There's geographical information. There's information about how to stay well. There's information about how to maintain a sense of togetherness. There's all kinds of knowledge about where do you find your food sources. There's hundreds of different things. There's things that are relative to water, how to make fire. You know, there's a story about how fire first came to be, about the constellations. How did these stars line up? You know, like the Big Dipper, the Big Dipper at one time was a fisher. You know, when he got rid of the old man winter, he went to the sky world. So there's this whole transference of knowledge. And because this was not written down, the younger generation don't have access. And I believe very strongly, and in fact, I'm teaching a course right now to younger people, that we need this because of the history of what happened here in Canada with the indigenous children being taken from their parents who were their immediate story keepers. These are spirit catchers, these stories. They tell the children about strong spirit, maybe not so good spirit. Even seasons have a spirit. Everything has a spirit. Everything around us, where there's a mineral spirit, animal spirit, you know, water, everything has a spirit. And of course, if you're in the confines of a square box, you don't get that. Come be with us at the Ottawa Children's Storytelling Festival online at the Ottawa Public Library website. Click on the Kids Zone and hear magic. Mm -hmm.